Full disclosure, this book hit me very hard the first time I read it, and rereading it five years later, I completely forgot the capacity it has to just wreck me. I didn't quite feel right for a day after reading it, which is, is rare for me. So <laughs> strap yourself in for that element of it. This is not a spoiler-free summary. It's the third of my series on Ishiguro's books. Um, we're going into each of them in depth and I'll keep going on that in the subsequent months. We're introduced to Stevens, an old style British butler working at an old style British county house called Darlington Hall in England. He's currently in the employee of an American businessman called Mr. Faraday, who came into possession of the house following the death of the previous owner. Faraday is traveling for business and suggests to his butler that he takes a road trip while he's gone. Stevens, who is a staunch workaholic to say the least, decides to take him up on his offer to go and see one of his old colleagues, Miss Ken now Mrs. Ben, who left Darlington Hall 20 years prior. He sees Miss Kenton as a perfect solution to some minor difficulties he's having with currently running the house. One of his problems is that he's struggling to banter with his new employer, something that's of great regret to him. As Stevens travels through the British countryside, we're given flashbacks to his life as a butler during the 1920s and 1930s. He gives us descriptions of what he believes the, the perfect encapsulation of dignity is. One example he relays is one his father told him of a butler who encounters a tiger in the dining room. The butler promptly fetched a shotgun and uh, killed the tiger and made sure everything was, was tidied away in time for dinner. Another story is from his father's life. His father is required to serve a general who is responsible for the wasteful death of his son, Stephen's brother, in a war with the British in South Africa. He performs his duty with the utmost professionalism, so much so that the general directly praises him. Stevens highlights this stoicism, this uh, removal of emotions from the role of a butler as the perfect way to do the role. In the 1920s, however, his father, who uh, Stevens has employed uh, to work for Lord Darlington, is getting frail. Lord Darlington, the master of Darlington Hall, considers himself an expert in foreign affairs. In 1923, there was a conference between Lord Darlington and several other political grandees from the UK and internationally, who are discussing how to relieve what they saw as punitive measures that have been imposed on the German government following their defeat in World War One, His father dies during the conference, but Stevens carries on with his work, putting aside his emotions. He's supported by Miss Kenton, the head housekeeper who Stevens uh, is very close to, though he makes it his business to criticize her for very minor things on a multiple occasion. Over the years, they build a rapport and they start to have evening meetings together where they enjoy each other's company. Eventually, as time goes on and the decade passes, it becomes very clear to the reader that Lord Darlington is a Nazi sympathizer with fascist leanings. Although Stevens makes it very clear that he only briefly associated with the British fascist movement led by Sir Oswald Mosley. A point of tension occurs when Darlington hosts the Prime Minister and the Foreign Secretary to encourage them on the path of appeasement at the same time whereas Miss Kenton uh, tells Stevens that she is going to get married. Stevens responds very frostily to the news that his closest companion is leaving and at the same time pretends he has very little to do with what's going on in the other room. He's just serving as a butler. In the present, uh, Stevens makes his way across uh, rural England, coming across a number of scenes of idyllic nature. He eventually makes it to his destination and meets Miss Kenton for a coffee, their first in 20 years, and it's a very emotional, happy moment in many ways. However, it becomes very clear that Miss Kenton, now Mrs. Ben, has lived a very sad life over the past 20 years with a husband that doesn't appreciate her. As he waits over at the bus stop to go home, uh, Miss Kenton Kenton tells him that she was always hoping that he would ask her to marry him, but she often pictured her life with him. Stephen's response, uh, just to the reader of, um, why should I not admit it that at that moment my heart was breaking, has a big emotional punch. Eventually he makes his way to Weymouth where he has a conversation with an older gentleman who uh, reminds him that the best part of life is the evening. He really commits himself to going back to Darlington Hall and dedicates himself to improving his bantering. Uh, I don't know how to talk about this book without getting sad. <laughs> One clear theme that pervades his work even stronger than previous Ishiguro's we've read is the clear theme of regret. Stevens is utterly incapable of expressing his regret for other novels. That he's found himself alone managing the remains of a noble institution that he spent his entire life defending that has proven to be morally wrong. A lot of discussions of this book have referred to uh, Hannah Ardent and the idea of the banality of evil, and that certainly does come in a little bit here. It's the idea that evil isn't always committed by um, 
dastardly villains or people who are, are confident in what they're doing. It's quite often carried out by the middle managers of the world, the people who are just following orders. Stevens firing Jewish employees on the whims of his master is something that's particularly jarring, especially given how cheerfully he seems to do it. Stevens argues that he was against this at the time and he tells Miss Kenton that a year later. She's shocked by this and actually incredibly sad that he didn't say anything to her at the time as she felt so alone in her disagreement of it. It's unclear whether we're meant to believe that Stevens is lying here and that he is proving a false narrator, that really he was enthusiastic about carrying out his master's wishes and that he's rewriting his history with the anxieties of the present, or whether he's simply so withdrawn into the idea of impartiality that he can't object to things that he sees as utterly morally repugnant. Certainly that's the idea that he wants to put across. Bear in mind that this novel is telling the story from 1954 backwards, which I didn't mention earlier. Oops. <laughs> like most of Ishiguro's narrators, he, uh, he acknowledges that his memory is faulty, that he may be getting some of the words that people said wrong or giving them to in different characters entirely. Uh, another time he kind of stomps around loudly and angrily outside Miss Kenton's room, but we don't actually get told that by him. We get told that through Miss Kenton's dialogue. He presents the situation as, you know, completely chill. He's not the most emotionally expressive chap, it's fair to say. He's unable to cross the emotional bridge that's keeping him from A, admitting that he actually has feelings for Miss Kenton, B, asking her not to leave once she announced she's getting married, and C, letting Mr. Faraday know that maybe his journey across the countryside isn't quite so much for business as he's pretending it is. It's a gross like these that are clearly consuming Stevens. He speaks of not knowing exactly what point in his life he could call a turning point, about not knowing exactly where things went wrong and that he wished he did. Graham McPhee makes a strong point that uh, the things that Stevens points out as important in the narrative are usually not so important and the things that he uh, kind of declines to talk about at great length are the things that actually do matter more. A side note, it's important to say that the England of this novel is not actually a historical England. It's also not, not historical England. But in an interview, Ishiguro says uh, it's certainly it's not an England that he ever imagined existed. He says, I've not attempted to reproduce in a historically accurate way some past period. Rather, he's aiming to rework a particular myth about a certain kind of mythical England. That is to say, an England with sleepy, beautiful villages, uh, with very polite people and butlers and people taking tea on the lawn. So he, he, what he's saying here is he's more interested in how a particular... Uh, a setting or place can come to mean something more than it actually is. Something that can take off into the realm of metaphor and, and parable. Darlington is a creation. Meetings didn't happen in, in such a way. Stevens is coming to terms with this fictionalised idea of the past at the same time that we, the reader, are also doing so and looking back on our own ideas of, of England's history. This follows on from what uh, some scholars have referred to as Stevens taking a pilgrimage through uh, rural England. He comes across unusual characters that change his way of thinking about things as you would in the pilgrimage. For example, a white-haired man that directs him to go up the hill. There he sees the best view in all of England and it's this thing that prompts him to think about what makes the great English butler. Likewise, he meets a woman with an apron who, who treats him kindly, which causes him to reflect back on the way that he treated his own father or, or more accurately mistreated. This idea of a great butler and especially the idea of dignity is essential to the novel and the way that Stevens tells it. He uses it to define who he is, how he should act, how he has acted, how he acts in regards to those who, who love him. And he uses it to assess his successes and his failures throughout the novel. For example, Stevens fails to comfort his father on his deathbed, and yet he describes a great sense of triumph on that day because of how the conference went so well. Ignoring for a second that he is, of course, crying in this scene and that Miss Kenton steps in and actively supports him. It's a fascinating shield for Stevens that that he believes he has to perform this role of emotionless, unperturbed butler. It's one that allows him to hide the fact that um, He'd likely have emotional difficulty regardless of the profession that he was in. It's one that more easily allows him to, to uh, defend his compliancy, stating, There is little choice other than to leave our fate, ultimately, in the hands of those great gentlemen. It also, of course, means he can justify his decision not to leave for a married life with Miss Kenton. Butlers do not leave their careers to have a family, certainly not great butlers. And he often speaks disparagingly to Miss Kenton throughout the novel of people in their own employ, 
who do the exact same thing. This idea of this, this artificial um, English butler is underlined by his relationship with his new employer, Mr. Faraday. Stevens is in many senses the ideal British butler because he's, he's, he's kind of more Jeevesian than Jeeves, you know? This comes into a kind of clash when Stevens tries to pretend that he hasn't been a long time butler at the house to one of Mr. Faraday's American friends. The boss is like, hey, what gives? And Stevens isn't able to give an accurate answer as to, to why it is he did that. This also ties in with the fact that during his pilgrimage, some locals mistake him for a lord. The way Stevens acts is way more in association with gentlemanly behaviour than the average manservant. Is this haughtiness? Is this pride in his work? Yeah, well, probably a bit of both, innit? But I, I would argue more pride than haughtiness, especially as he's noticeably relieved when when an actual person of the gentry is able to point out that he is a manservant. He's like, God, I mean, <laughs> I like being seen as important, but what cost, dude, or what cost? <laughs> Listen, we love any book that has a Wikipedia section on banter. <laughs> yes, Stevens, absolutely. Lad. So Stevens is very concerned during the novel that his banter's just not just not hitting the mark. He's not he's not he's not doing it well. He's identified it as something that Mr. Faraday expects from his servants as an American, but also something that he's incapable of producing himself. Stevens is unable to respond properly. There's one joke thrown at him about keeping uh, one of the wives of the guests entertained and he just doesn't know what to say to that. This goes back to his further uh, discomfort in the novel when he's trying to uh, explain the birds and the bees to young Mr. Cardinal. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't go, it doesn't go great. Um, completely gets the wrong end of the stick of what he's trying to tell him. His attempts to tell jokes throughout the novel are incredibly endearing, but they do mostly fall flat. This is down to him seeing a social conversation as something you can rehearse for and practice for, which is incredibly on brand for Stevens. Indeed, the novel ends with this idea of going back to bantery and committing to it. Sadly, he's likely never to achieve this, this goal he set for himself, just like he's never gonna be able to become the ideal emotionless butler that he wishes he was. Firstly, he's unable to achieve the spontaneity of it, but secondly, what he doesn't realise is that it's very unlikely that Mr. Faraday wants him to achieve in delivering American-style banter. He's a genuine English butler, and that's what he bought. So that's what he wants to get. <sighs> Sad. 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 Yeah, as a whole, I think this book is, is beautifully written. I think it's tightly focused, I think it gives you plenty to contemplate, and I think it's devastatingly sad. So, you know, read it. Let me know in the comments uh, whether you think this is Ishiguro's best work, if it's his masterpiece, uh, it's the one you want the book for. The next novel I will be reading as part of this series is The Unconsoled, um, which will be a time. So I'll, I'll see you next time, next month.